Hi there, my name is uh, Chris Clay. I'm a 1976 graduate and still walking, still working actually in a lovely place in Tennessee. And um, I'm going to talk to you about some of the history of perfusion that I experienced and hopefully relate those experiences to the present um, because I'm one of the living representatives of the past. You're not filming this, are you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, when I started, uh, there were no safety devices, no alarms, no pressure monitoring, no ACTs, uh, and uh, no level sensors, none of that sort of stuff. So anyway, there was a um, three oxygenators. One was a hard shell called the Bentley Temptrol, and there were two bag oxygenators that looked like somebody had taken raincoat material and heat welded it with stainless steel sponges in it, and an aquarium air stone that you could have bought at Woolworths. I mean, seriously, we were dealing with aquarium air stones that cost $1.98. And uh, so those were our three choices. The Bentley Temptrol was so fragile because they didn't have the plasticizers right that if you hit it the wrong way with a clamp it would shatter like glass i mean it was just you could break it with your hands so that was a little scary um but anyway i do remember one time the travenol bag had a cuff above the air stone so that you could change the diameter of the oxygenating column so you pumped up this cuff with a blood pressure thing and the cuff would, would compress the, the oxygenating tube and make it bigger or smaller so you could increase the dwell time. So the blood would stay with the bubbles longer. Well, one time my, I was using that cuff and my, my cuff had a leak and I happened to be chewing some bubble gum. And so I took the bubble gum and plaqued it on the outside of the, of the cuff and pumped it up. And it looked great for about 30 seconds. And then the bubble gum blew a bubble and popped. And that was the end of that patch. So we did a lot of that sort of stuff. I mean, talking about all these early days things. I mean, I had an ant in the reservoir of my oxygenator once. It was a sterile ant. But nevertheless, when I primed it, there was this black thing that was stuck in the plastic. And it sort of floated up. And I thought, what? What is that? Another time I had a piece of a stick that was also floating around because they used to glue the connectors onto these hard shell oxygenators. They weren't able to make injection molds that complicated. So literally they had people that they would pay to dip glue and stuff these things on. So the arterial and the venous and the whatever. One day at Texas Art, all eight rooms were priming at the same time. And we had a lot where the glue hadn't been put in. So we dumped the prime in and everybody's connections fell out and all the prime ran on the floor and everybody ran in the middle and everybody was like, what? You know? So anyway, you have to imagine that kind of a life. We, we, really, uh, we really had it a little bit different. Um, oh, and by the way, Deb, my first yearly salary was 9,900. Yeah. Diane Clark was sent by Charlie Reed to give us a lecture and tell us she told us with a straight face, do not take a job for less than $10,000 a year. And so we all sat there and oh, okay, okay. I never let her forget that. For 40 years, I said, yeah, remember what you hired me at? 9,000. <laughs> but anyway, but a serious moment. Uh, in 1979, you can look this up. It's, an, it's a, an article that's easy to find. There was a 1979 survey done by a Dr. William Stoney, S-T-O-N-E-Y. At that time, he found that only 63% of the respondents used ACTs. That means there's 37% of the people were just pumping and going. Wing. Yeah, winging it. <laughs> and only 43% used level detectors. Not surprisingly, there were quite a few serious in incidents, air embolism, clotting. I had a circuit clot completely on me. Um, I was doing a, a tube, intermittently shaking it and sticking it in my underwear and shaking it, stopping. 
timing it, you know. And I found out that my blood activated recalcification time was 164. And by that time, I heard this dreaded noise of the roller pump trying to pump clot. And that was the end of that. That was not even an open heart patient. It was a resuscitation effort. So there was massive blood loss. I mean, the blood was running off everywhere. And, um, you know, that's a, a situation that it took me three or four cases to realize that I had to compensate for the massive loss of heparin. Okay, you're thinking about the blood, the blood's all over and you see it, but you don't always necessarily think about losing your heparin at the same time. Nowadays, that's extremely important because as Jim said, our heparin is really not good quality. So if you experience a, a severe blood loss case, think about maybe grabbing your cell saver sucker and hooking it up and running it at flush. Um, so in addition to the rate of one serious air embolism per thousand cases, there were also non-patient injury incidents in every three cases. Every three cases, there was some sort of ant in the reservoir, a stick, you know, whatever happened. Um, I had one of those, uh, I had one of those uh, non-patient injury episodes once I was sitting on a SARNS heater cooler, which you can Google. It was a, a heater cooler that had a large, I don't know, basin part of it where you dump ice. And it was a nice, it was a nice height for sitting on top of and watching students do cases. So I was lounging because I had an advanced student and I was sitting on there, you know, watching her do this case. And all of a sudden I heard this kind of funny pinging coming from the heater cooler. It was like ping, 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 weird noise. I started smelling hot wiring and I thought, well, this isn't very good. And then it really got loud and the electrical smell got really bad. And the heart lung machine started looking like a pinball machine. The lights were like going off and then they were going on and the pump was stopping. It was a roller pump and it just was terrible. So I jumped off the burning heater cooler. My student was an advanced student, so she grabbed a hand crank because back then we had zero batteries. I mean, the batteries, there were no batteries. It was a hand crank. So she was a really good student and she grabbed her hand crank and started cranking the arterial knob for dear life, which was somewhat difficult because when the power was off, the pump was designed to disengage the belt. And so you could crank fairly easily. It was made to crank that way, but when the power came back on, she was like, Ugh. You know, so Dr. Cooley looked over at that moment when she was going, eh, and he said, get an orderly in here to crank the pump. And immediately I, I looked at him and I said, no, no orderly, veto the orderly. I could see him sucking the patient dry, <laughs> going backwards, you know, I did just unimaginable things. So anyway, we finally figured that out. And it was a typical problem in the early days to have very bad circuitry in the OR. So we had the heater cooler and the pump plugged in the same circuit. Nowadays, I don't think any of you would even remotely think about doing that. It's one of the things you're taught. <coughs> ah, I see some laughter over there. It's one of the things you're immediately taught, you know, different circuits for everything. So we learned, we learned that. Um, so these system failures taught us how to be creative. Okay, they taught us and I think that's a hallmark of perfusion. So I, as, as a profession and, and my colleagues that I know, they're the most creative people you can imagine. I mean, they're always innovating. They're always, I can make that work. Sure, you know, just let me, let me add it. I'll, I'll, I'll rig up something for you, you know? That's, I think our number one characteristic is that we're inventive and creative and we adapt and innovate. So, you know, there were a lot of really, interesting things that we learned. For example, when we first started running membrane oxygenators, the Symed Colobos, we didn't have blenders. We just had these big tanks. And so we had to figure out, well, we don't have a blender. What, we don't want to run 100% O2, it's too much, especially on babies. I mean, we had, we had one membrane that was like a half of a little juice can. It was the cutest little thing. So anyway, um, we learned that we could Y and a room air pump head, we can make a pump head and make it totally occlusive and then wire it into our oxygen tank source. 
and that would dilute it. And then we could sit there and do the math and say, okay, we're at 60%, which is sometimes a little challenging because I'm not very good at math. So, you know, it was, it was an interesting way to do it. And another thing that we learned is that a lot of the early cardioplegia sets had built-in air chambers. Sarns made a, a cardioplegia set that had a little, you could never get the air out. It was supposed to be there. And as you would pump, you could see what the pressure was, even without looking at your pressure monitoring, you could see by the compression of the air, you know? And so if, if I have an instance, I, it hasn't happened in a long, long time, except on mission trips, but if you have an instance where you don't have a pressure monitor, you can use a small air level if the device will allow you to do that. I wouldn't do that routinely, but it, you know, in an emergency or a situation where you have no monitoring, you can, you can tell how you're compressing your, your system. Another thing you can do is learn how to use your fingers. You know, make your own little wet lab and, and occlude a, a, a fluid filled roller pump and, and learn to tell what the pressure is with your fingers. I mean, when we had no pressure, we diagnosed dissections going on bypass by holding onto the arterial line. And if it got stiff, you were really in trouble. Somebody clamped it, you had a dissection. So, you know, that, that was a, a good way to do it. So, you know, you have to get creative to overcome system failures. The other thing that I would tell you is if you have to do the improvisation that we all have to do sometimes, or we think we have to do to make something better, be sure that you consider all the aspects. Once when we were running those SIMED membranes, uh, we, we, we didn't get the result we wanted in terms of oxygenation. So we called up Dr. Colobo. I mean, who, who better to tell us how to run his membrane than the inventor? So we called him up and he told us we should humidify the gases, that that silicone membrane would function much better if we humidify the gases. What he didn't know is that we had an O2 filter in line between the gas source and where we were going to plug in the humidifier. And uh, there was also a safety valve on the actual bracket that held the SIMED that would pop off if there was excessive pressure. Well, so we humidified the gas. Everything looked like it was going great. You know, Dr. Colobo was, was wonderful. And then I got ready to leave the hospital and I got this frantic call that, that the arterial line's turning black. And I went running back up there. And what had happened is the O2 filter had got soaking wet because of the humidity and had overpressurized backwards and had popped off the safety valve and there was no gas. So we went from having some gas to having humidified gas, which then ruined the whole situation. So, yeah, you have to you have to consider all aspects when you're Im improvising something. And one of my personal favorite perfusion stories um, had to do with the Sarns heater cooler, which was the heater cooler that pumped 40 liters a minute, and you could dump all kinds of ice in it. Well, Dr. Cooley was always always saying, "Can't you cool faster? You know, you're just too slow." I think you all have heard all of this many many times. So I had what I thought was a brilliant idea. Um, sometimes I am brilliant on this occasion, maybe not. So I had this idea that if I wide in two heater coolers, I'd still stay below the pressure limit and everything would be wonderful. I'd be pumping 80 liters a minute of ice water, okay? So I filled them all up with ice, you know, and Dr. Cooley came in and it took up quite a bit of room with all the wires and the tubing and everything. He's like, what is this? You know, what, what is this? I said, oh, you're going to be so happy. It's just going to cool like a son of a gun. It's just going to be amazing. So I turned it on and sure enough, I'm watching the patient's temperature. We're going to do an arch aneurysm. So we're going to like 15 degrees and I'm watching and boy, those tenths of a degree are just like it looked like Las Vegas. I mean, they were just rolling around. It was just like, bing, 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 you know? So anyway, so I was so happy. I just thought I was the queen of perfusion. I mean, I was sitting there all puffed up, just like, oh, I'm so good. And then I heard this noise and I thought, hmm. And I, I turned around, it was this burn. And I turned around just in time to see the lid from one heater cooler geysering off. And 
like a tidal wave coming towards me is this lid and this gush of water. And it hits the floor and there's water everywhere. And the other machine is totally dry and going, and the coolest like, what is going on over there? And I'm like, there's literally a tidal wave coming at me. Oh man, I was so embarrassed. I had to shut the one off, of course. It was totally dry, but I hadn't thought about the differential in the pump motors. I thought it was brilliant. Doesn't this sound brilliant? So anyway, there I was with you know this one dry, and for the whole rest of that semi-long case, I'm squishing around in the OR on this water. Well, it was really embarrassed. So anyway, I could keep you guys entertained with stories for hours. However, the main thing I would like to convey is um, when you look at your older colleagues, talk to them. Ask them for some of these silly stories that maybe will teach you something without having to go through the pain and the wetness of learning it yourself, you know? Talk to, talk to the old farts while they're still around and see what they have to say to you because there, there are some things that translate everywhere, you know? All these things that I learned that are just physical things, common sense things, you know, they're, they're great for mission trips, which I highly advise you all to do. I mean, mission trips are the most wonderful thing in the world to do. You get back to the reality of what you're actually doing. You're actually saving lives. And when you go on a mission trip and you actually get to see somebody whose life is forever changed because you showed up, it's amazing. It's the best thing in the world. So congratulations to all of you that are gonna graduate from this school. It's a great place. It's, it's been amazing to be a tech, Texas art graduate. I look around the room and I, I see people that I've known for decades and I'm really proud. I'm really proud to know all of you. So thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me.